drunken spirit. If I found out the name of a spirit, how can I get rid of its influence on another person? Can I do it on my own, and what kind of consequences would both of us face for interfering with the fate of a friend who drinks? Well here, as I understand, the question is about such phenomenon as a drunken demon, or drunken spirit. And for a Russian mentality, it is quite a regular guest. What are the chances that a person who is prone to alcoholism is possessed by a drunken spirit or by any other entity associated with alcoholism? In reality, it is not always the case. I assume that you, colleagues, understand that an irrational consciousness would always look for the reasons for its problems in the external influence. But a rational consciousness would try to take a look inside as well. That is why the reasons for alcoholism are not always associated with a drunken spirit. But Lucy is asking about a specific phenomenon, and even mentions that she knows its name. It is possible. What type of phenomenon is that, and how can it be managed? Russian black book magic, as a rule, distinguishes and assigns the role of a drunken spirit to some restless dead soul. And in general, when it talks about drunken demons, it implies exactly the latter. Once there lived a long time ago, or maybe not too long ago, some uncle Vashya, an alcoholic, and he didn't rest in peace but, for some reason, remained in this very reality. And this uncle Vashya wants to eat, but even more so, he really wants to have a drink. But without a physical body, he can't achieve this type of happiness while present in a completely different dimension. That is why he needs a physical form. Therefore, he takes possession of some weak consciousness, finds his way in, and gets lodged into it. A weak consciousness is incapable of resistance especially during alcoholism, and sooner or later this very structure that used to be alive once before, takes a complete possession of a currently living alcoholic. Can this happen? Yes it can. What else can it be? There are also programs that are intentionally designed to cause alcoholism. These are spoilages, so-called spoilages. As a rule, they don't usually carry a name, they have certain codes, verbal and non-verbal, but those are not the name. Sometimes they consist of numerical codes, sometimes they have sound codes. In any case, such programs are usually designed intentionally designed by masters, sorcerers, and occultists. They are created on a particular channel. This topic was discussed in great detail during our previous meetings. Anything that applies to spoilage, everything is there. You may review this topic and refresh your memory, and also find some additional information. We won't discuss the topic of spoilage at this time. There are also the inhabitants of other worlds. They are the ones who are typically called demons, meaning that they are not a previously existed consciousness, but rather a straight foreigner, harmful entity that can't truly exist in our world, but somehow manages to sneak in by getting lodged into a dense body and starts to use this body at its own discretion. As a rule, the above situation is rarely associated with alcoholism. Usually those entities pursue slightly different goals and tasks. And the ability to access this really is more likely to be an accident than a regularity. That is why, as a rule, a drunken spirit, a drunken demon is more likely to follow the first example or the second one, and rarely the third. It suppresses the will, but usually affects those whose will is already weak. But whose will is weak? Firstly, those who don't enhance it, 
those who naturally possess numerous vulnerabilities. A very frail consciousness, as a rule, is the one of a child who, maybe, only recently has been incarnated here, and of course, he is not protected by anyone and has no ancestral roots. Even if he has a kin and a tribe, usually such a person is casted out to the very periphery of his own interests, placed into a dead space. He serves as a shield for the whole family in the role of a scapegoat for all their future problems. That is why if the kin has vulnerabilities, if there is a need to pay off the debt for something or someone from the family, then such a person becomes very desirable. Sometimes even the kin, as if putting a tag on this person, states that this free consciousness could be dealt with in any way you like. Overall, the kin makes it known in any way possible that, if something were to happen, then no one would stand up for this person, and if the need arises, this individual can be utilized. Judging by Lucy's question, here we likely have a problem with someone close to her. Since Lucy is involved in this matter and even knows the name of the entity that has broken the person close to her, one will happen to be stronger than another. But there is a certain amount of fear, which is quite logical, since those things are unknown, how to fight them, how to handle them, it's pretty complicated. Usually when such a program, let's call it a program, a personal or mathematical one, penetrates a person, it can be very easily banished out of the consciousness as long as it can be diagnosed just as easily. That is, until it hasn't acclimated, hasn't spread its roots, everything can be fixed. In general, an example of mistletoe is appropriate here. Those who study the general theory of magic, in later lectures on Scandinavian mythology, know that we discuss the topic of mistletoe in great detail, as well as its symbolism and its biological nature, its biological manifestation and mechanisms of introduction into a healthy plant. And here, roughly the same mechanism is applicable. When a mistletoe inhabits a tree, it does not immediately infect it, it does not reveal itself on this tree right away. At first, as if hidden within it, it gradually makes it weaker. Sometimes this process can take up to three years. I'm talking about a mistletoe right now. And during this process, it starts to gradually change a genetic makeup of a tree itself. Therefore, making it not only weaker, but also forcing it to perceive this foreign entity as its own. That is why raging alcoholics face extreme difficulty when taking radical steps in order to get rid of this part of themselves. Here, the situation is similar to a mistletoe. Eventually it won't matter how often you cut it down, it just keeps on growing. That is why a tree ought to be protected from a mistletoe from the very beginning. Forest rangers and gardeners know that if a mistletoe appeared, it can be very difficult to handle it. Serious chemicals are used as well as some significant techniques of cutting off everything that is possible, as if practically amputating all of the healthy offshoots in order to get rid of potentially germinated seeds of a mistletoe. Here the same principle applies. When such a program penetrates the consciousness, it does not manifest itself right away. At the beginning, it must spread its roots and weaken a person's will. And you can periodically witness it in a person. Anger outbursts, mood swings, depressive state, with no obvious cause. But as a rule, such an ability to control one's emotions comes from the fact that the emotional field is the first one to be seized by this force. Just like a mistletoe, after invading the tree, it primarily targets the water flow that tree receives.
A mistletoe needs water, but it has none. A lodged entity acts in the exact same way. This is the same situation. It needs emotions, but it doesn't have any. It is a mathematical structure. And emotion is rather a live formation. It belongs to the living. They are the ones who can express them. Only those who are alive can feel and express emotions. That is why it takes possession as if sprouting into the astral body and forming certain reservoirs of possibilities for itself. And these reservoirs of possibilities are very similar to the immovable marks in the astral plane, the ones that the students of my school are perfectly aware of how to work with. And such reservoirs are controlled by this entity. The more serious this program is, the more it is capable of protecting them on its own. Even though it sprouts into the conscious environment almost entirely, reaching the physical and etheric levels, astral and mental levels, it can't impact the higher levels. But the higher levels, in this case, are simply deprived of the source of nutrition that comes from the lower layers of consciousness, since everything is seized by the entity. Restless soul follows the same principle, a specially formed program follows it as well. The entity that comes from the other worlds acts in a slightly different manner since it can obtain nutrition from totally different sources. For example, it only affects a mental field or the etheric one. This may happen, but its influence can be sufficient enough to be considered as a serious threat. In mysticism and occultism it is called a possession, a lodging, and it is quite difficult to manage it. Then Lucy's question continues. Can I do it on my own, and what are the consequences for both of us for interfering with the fate of the unrest? The interference might be possible, but here you should understand a simple rule that for any force there is another force present. The main thing is that the second force is stronger. Only the structures related to superconsciousness can be the strongest. Firstly, a human's will is stronger a priori because it is capable of connecting a person with his own God. And there is nothing higher than God's in its essence. If there is a will it would reach what it needs and find the support, but if there is no will, then a person is forced to rely on the egregore of a human world. First of all, it's an egregore of the religion, quite a serious cult, any cult for that matter, that had already been worshipped, preyed upon, and that is capable, with the use of elemental forces, informational currents, to send such an entity into the worlds it could exist, or to disembody or incinerate it completely. In this case, of course, the physical body and personal structure of a human is affected since he would feel all this process very deeply. Just imagine that you are burning a mistletoe right there in the tree, and it has already spread its roots. These exact roots when affected by chemicals, or by fire, or being destroyed, they certainly affect all nerve endings, and not only nerve endings, but also the whole spiritual organization of the person who they are trying to get rid of this system. The entity itself, while living inside of a human consciousness, for a long time, becomes semi-alive. By doing that it gains some type of consciousness, in a certain sense, but first of all it wants to exist and will fight for its own life. The only thing it possesses is the physical body of the person himself which is the reason for those people to act aggressively, irrationally, with extreme anger when someone is trying to banish this program out of them. That is why it is better for someone weaker to stay away from such people. If you manage to banish it, there is no guarantee that it won't jump to someone next, someone closer that would happen to be there. It usually shows as animals. But ancient priests, when banishing the entities of a similar kind, 
would transfer them into the animals and then slaughter them right away, those animals, in any way possible, but immediately killing them following a certain ritual. Then there is a guarantee that this time a restless soul would leave for the worlds where it belongs. The second scenario, a magical one, is quite complicated. Here one should possess a skill of a ritual practice of transferring this very entity into a certain artifact, something of a dense structure. Typically, stones were used for that, figurines, amulets. They were sealed with a spell and buried somewhere into the ground, into the sand. But sometimes they would come to the surface. There was a very good movie back in the 90s, called Jumanji, I think that many of you had seen it. This would be an example of a spiritualized object, of a spiritualized program that had come to the surface. It would stay dormant for hundreds of years and then would reappear again. But that is only if it was sealed properly. As a rule, the banishing occurs on a certain channel and only mage, a cultist and priest can guarantee that the entity had left. Usually it tries to jump to someone weaker. Animals, children, sick people and, unfortunately nowadays, women are the weaker ones. Especially today because it was not like that before. The reason for that is in women, if they are in the religious environment, if they are married, have a husband, as a rule, they no longer have the support of the mother goddess who would protect them no matter what, neither they have the support of their own gods who would protect them as well. You know that rule, who follows a serf becomes one, that is why if a woman was baptized, a man was baptized, then the only way is to run back to a pope, there is no one else otherwise. That is why the aggressive reaction from the system is possible. Therefore, Lucy, here's my answer to you, if you are not an experienced mage, if you've never done it before, and judging by your question, you've never done it, and knowing just the name would not be enough in here, because you also need to know how to, first of all, open the channel and then close it afterwards, like a door, close it tight and turn the key so it would not come back, either to transfer it, also knowingly, with the appropriate amount of seals and keys. You should possess the knowledge, you should possess the skill. If you don't know how to do it, then it's better to approach a specialist. But I also have one more piece of advice for you. No one would do it better than the person himself because, when banishing such an entity out of someone, imagine that all of this is being ripped out with the roots, and the person is left with empty spaces. And if he doesn't start filling them in immediately, saturating them with the right kind of force, with a pure will power, then sacred space is never empty, they say, something else would manage to get in there. No guarantee it won't be the same thing, exactly the same thing. That is why, colleagues, here is my advice for all of you. Maintain the hygiene of your consciousness, evolve your willpower, pay close attention to your mood, the mood of those close to you, it is important, because it is the very first signal, the emotions are the first thing they get attached to. Human emotions are the most delicious, the strongest. A human being, compared to many other living creatures, is capable of going through a vast diapason of emotions in a certain amount of time, and not too many creatures are capable of that. We may not have too much brain and may be lacking knowledge, but when it comes to emotions, Everything is great in that aspect. We are emotionally feeling creatures. Humans have been developing these very areas of their consciousness all their lives. There is no surprise that they are the strongest. That is why one should pay attention to such things in the first place. Drunken demons, I would like to point out, usually get attached to a person at the cemetery. This is the space in between the worlds, they have the right to be present, they are not prohibited. Therefore, if you visit a cemetery, take care of your own protection. Never eat or drink anything there. Don't bring your children, I spoke about it, and will say it again. Remember that you must take care of yourself.
So, keep yourself safe, keep your children safe, pay attention to people close to you, study your family system, know that if someone is dear to you, you must also take care of them, and not just of yourself. That includes the hygiene of the willpower as well as the emotional hygiene. Then everything will be okay. And you, Lucy, I wish you all the best and good luck on your chosen path. Fighting for an alcoholic is always a hard task, a very tough one. But women are capable of much more, they say.